This is Andrei Belenko from uh, VR Forensics in Moscow. He uh, presented uh, here in Bergen in December 2010 at the very first Passwords Conference. The only, I, the only one guy who ever wore a tie to these. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and, and we have to tell the story once again. <laughs> right, Andrei? Go I, ahead, go ahead. I, look at yourselves. <coughs> what you look like. And he, was, he had the first talk on the second day of the conference. And on day one, he was dressed like a normal person. And on the second day, he came in a suit and white shirt and tie and was like, are, are you the guy going to talk about GPU cracking? <laughs> but he looked really handsome. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that. But. OK, so no further ado. This is Andre Belenko. And I would just say he needs a warm welcome being back in Bagen again. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, one small correction. Via Forensics is in Chicago, but yeah, I still work from Moscow. Um, today I would like to tell you a little bit about iCloud Keychain and changes to data protection in iOS 7. So uh, let's start with the shorter and simpler part with the data protection. As some of you might know, Data protection is a set of technologies in iOS operating system that are designed to uh, protect user data from uh, unauthorized access. Those technologies include several different mechanisms. Uh, one of them, and very important one, is the keychain. Keychain is a storage of passwords, basically. Uh, it's a central storage of passwords, and uh, iOS manages that storage. Keychain was there in iPhones since the very beginning, since the very first iPhone. But before iOS 4, it was, well, not very good. The encryption key that was used to protect passwords was um, fixed for a particular device. So every device, well, speaking in, in a way, every device came with the hard-coded key that was protecting the keychain. And no matter how many times you reset or wipe your device, the key remained the same. So obviously that was no good. But fortunately, starting with iOS 4 and going forward, Apple redesigned the keychain encryption completely. It was now using random per item key. And that key was, in turn, protected with another key what was, that was based on desired item accessibility. And, uh, what exactly is item accessibility? Well, it is basically, uh, it's hard to explain. Well, some applications need to access keychain items when they're running, when the device is unlocked. Other device might need to access keychain items when the device is locked. Well, think uh, about this. If you're designing, for example, a browser, and you're adding feature like uh, auto complete for passwords or something like that, it is very likely that uh, browser will only need to access stored passwords only when device is unlocked. So there is no way uh, user will browse the internet while device is locked, right? So you can specify that this keychain item must be protected with the, um, must be accessible only when uh, device is unlocked. On the other hand, if you're designing something like email application, uh, that application might want to access the, the stored password even when the device is locked. For example, if application is fetching mail in background, this must be specified uh, that uh, application wants to access password even when the device is locked. And this is what uh, item accessibility is. Um, iOS 5 modified keychain encryption a little bit. Uh, first of all, it switched from AS-CBC mode to uh, GCM, uh, Galois account mode, which is authenticated encryption, which is a very good step. Uh, encryption keys remained also per item random keys, but another major improvement was that beginning with iOS 5, not only passwords themselves, but also all the metadata associated with the keychain item, such as login name, server name, creation date, modification date, uh, whatever, this stuff was also encrypted. So beginning with iOS 5, uh, all metadata is also encrypted. And you may, you may ask, how 
uh, Apple performs the search on the keychain well. In addition, well, b before that, uh, they stored the metadata in plain text and password was encrypted. Now everything is encrypted, but they store the SHA-1 hash of metada metadata items uh, in the database. So instead of storing, for example, creation date, they store uh, hash of the creation date. Instead of storing username, they store hash of the username. This way, application can still perform some sort of some queries on Keychain to uh, look up uh, the items. Uh, another major component of data protection is storage encryption. It was introduced in iOS 4. Well, some think that it was introduced, <coughs> introduced before, but uh, I would say that before our iOS 4, encryption was there merely to facilitate fast device wipe. It was not designed to provide any sort of confidentiality. But beginning with iOS 4, uh, encryption was implemented properly. It is a file level encryption. Um, in that sense, it is very much like Microsoft Windows encrypted file system. It's not like uh, PGP whole disk encryption or Linux DM crypt or other block uh, encryption things. Uh, and this is why carving for deleted files is nearly impossible on Apple devices. Um, encryption is done very similar to keychain item encryption. Every file uh, is encrypted with a random key, and that key is in turn encrypted with a protection key based on protection class. Protection class is the same as accessibility class for keychain items. With iOS 4, we had only two such classes, <laughs> file protection none, which meant that the file is encrypted but can be accessed at, at all times, even if device is locked, and file protection complete. Um, and files protected with this one could be opened only when device is unlocked. And that is not such only, s only um, uh, you know, s some check if device is locked, then don't allow this file to be opened. This was enforced uh, and is enforced cryptographically. So if the device is locked, there is just no encryption key that could uh, decrypt that file. Um, iOS 5 added two new classes. Um, one complete until first user authentication, which uh, prevented uh, access to the file until user has unlocked the device at least once. And once device is unlocked, that file remained accessible until the device is powered off or rebooted. And the second new one was complete unless open. That, was, that one is uh, uh, very interesting. It is based on public public key crypto. Uh, specifically, it uses uh, Daniel uh, Benstein's curve uh, 255.19. And uh, what that class does is that you can create a file and open it, I mean, for creation at any time, even if device is locked, and you can write to it. But once you close the file handle, you can only <coughs> open that file if the device is unlocked. So this is very useful for things like receiving email in background, taking pictures without unlocking the device, and so on. So what's new with iOS 7? Well, with the encryption stuff, the, the storage encryption, uh, I haven't seen any, anything noticeable. Existing tools continue to work, and they don't seem to uh, screw things up. So everything works, everything decrypts, and everybody's happy. Uh, there is one thing. Now, uh, Apple is encouraging developers to use protection classes because, well, protection classes have been introduced back in iOS 4 times, which is like three years ago, but adoption among developers was very, very low. So nobody cares about this. Nobody uses that because this is like a lot of brain damage. So how Apple approaches this problem? Well, typical Apple manner. Now, by default, everything is encrypted with the most restrictive uh, protection class. So if you want your Apple, uh, your application not to crash, well, you have to figure out why it crashes and change the protection class and whatever. And uh, this is actually a serious problem. So I faced a crash uh, because of that. My application was writing to a log file, text, text log. Well, application is writing to logs all the time. And um, that application was also performing some tasks in background. 
Uh, on the development device, everything was fine. Everything works, nothing crashes. Ooh, let's push to production. Let's push to production. First test, crash. Why? Because the production device has passcodes when device is locked. Uh, after, after 10 seconds after the device is locked, encryption keys are removed from the memory and all the file handles become unwritable. So we have a crash. So yeah, thank you Apple for uh, <coughs> forcing the encryption. Uh, and that was not even my code, that was an open source library for writing logs. So it was actually um, a problem inside that source code uh, of that library. Well, keychain. Keychain format uh, has changed a little bit, so uh, encryption hasn't changed, but the uh, encoding of data and metadata has changed. Before that, Apple has used uh, binary property list encoding, and now they're using SN.1, which is interesting. Uh, well, you don't really see Apple switching from something pr proprietary to something standard every day, so the question which I had is why are they doing this? So I don't know the answer, the definite ones, uh, answer, but here are uh, three speculations on the point. Uh, first and probably the most important one, that uh, ASN.1 uh, basic encoding rules or uh, distinguished encoding rules, they are sequential. So you can actually receive the stream and parse it as it arrives. With a binary property list, you actually have to receive all the data because the table of contents uh, located at the end of the stream. This is one advantage. The second one is the ASN.1 is more compact and it is cross-platform. So this may be a hint that Keychain is coming to Windows or I don't know, maybe, maybe not. So that's it about data protection and now let's move uh, to iCloud Keychain. Well, iCloud Keychain was arguably one of the most hyped features. It was presented at WWDC back in June, but unfortunately some other revelations uh, by Snowden, they came at about the same time and so Apple became much less vocal about this feature and they actually introduced it with, uh, the feature was present in all iOS 7 betas, it was not present in iOS 7 release and it was reintroduced only with the release of uh, OS 10 Mavericks in October. Um, so let's talk about this in a little more detail. So why do this? Well, uh, first of all, I have to say that this is not a, this is really a, my 20% project at work. So it's not something I put a lot of effort into, but still, uh, yeah, the motivation was this. So Apple makes a lot of claims about the security. So they state that information is encrypted and cannot be read by Apple. And more interestingly, Apple can't access any of the key material that um, can be, that could be used to decrypt that data. Um, so I think it's natural desire to know whether this is true or not. So let's, and um, it's not only about Apple, you know, because there are others who may force Apple to reveal some information. And uh, I'm not saying that Apple wants to read my data, but what I merely want to know is do they have the technical possibility to hand over my data in any decryptable or whatever form? Yeah, take, the, take your pictures. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's get back to iCloud. Well, uh, iCloud is a, it's not one service. Uh, it's a set of uh, many, many services. As you can see, this is a just a uh, screen you can see on your iPhone when you can enable, disable uh, different <coughs> services. And on the left, you can see the associated configuration, part of the configuration file, which is unique for every account. So Apple has technical ability to restrict set of uh, keychain services for a particular account, but uh, that's not the point. The, the point of this slide is that there are many, many services uh, that go by the name of iCloud. And today we will uh, look only on two of them uh, that are used by Keychain, by iCloud Keychain. Those are Keychain Sync and Key Value. So the first question, when, when you want to analyze something, the first uh, question is where do you look? Uh, so 
you don't have to look too hard because the very same configuration file contains the uh, endpoints, the server names for the services we're interested in. And specifically, you can see the URLs of those uh, services. So uh, <coughs> they are standard. And uh, this P19, so they, they start with the some random number, which, which is not really random, it's sequential. So as more people register for Apple IDs, I think that Apple adds servers or names. And so this is kind of uh, poor man's load balancing. So now we have this knowledge, and we want to figure out what exactly gets uh, sent to those services. So we take the device, set up the iCloud keychain, and just sniff the traffic uh, to figure out what's happening. So it is very easy to see that keychain and keybag are sent to the key value service, and something secret something very secret is sent to escrow proxy, which is the keychain sync service. And this is key value service. A um, few words about uh, terminology. Keychain, uh, keychain is your passwords. And keybag is a set of keys that are used to encrypt the keychain, the password inside your keychain. So just uh, this is Apple terminology. So I'm just trying to uh, explain it as simple as possible. Keyback is a set of keys that encrypt keychain. And keychain is just a set of uh, passwords. And how exactly do we know this? Well, it's not there. It's not very hard because although everything is inside HTTPS, there is no certificate pinning. So you just import your certificate, set up proxy, and you see all the data in clear. Wow. Now let's uh, try to figure out what exactly happens with this um, in, in more detail, because this is obviously not detailed enough. We want to know more. When you set up an iCloud keychain, you actually have a number of options. The default is a simple iCloud security code, four digits. Let's see how it works, what happens when you enable this. First of all, a random password is generated on the device. It looks like this, so it is 24, yeah, 24 uh, random numbers, uh, random characters. The next thing that happens on the device is that a new keyback is generated and passwords from the keychain that are marked as exportable, as the ones that can be uploaded to the iCloud keychain, are encrypted with this uh, new keyback using uh, AES Galo counter mode. Then, this random password is used to protect that uh, generated key back. So essentially, this random password becomes a master password for your keychain entries. This is what this uh, diagram says. This stuff is then uploaded to key value service, not the password, only the encrypted stuff. So this is more or less OK. But what is missing from this picture is my cloud security code. There is no on this picture. So let's try to find out what's happening to it. So when you enter iCloud security code, it is fed through pbkdf2 uh, with uh, 10,000 iterations. And that key is used to encrypt random password. And uh, encrypted random password is sent to a scroll proxy. <coughs> so now we have more or less the overall uh, architecture of the iCloud uh, keychain thing. Now let's, uh, let's see at what exactly is stored in the key value, key value service. Well, first of all, let me state that this, is, this service is not new at all. It was probably the first iCloud service introduced, and a lot of applications are using it to uh, keep preferences in sync across devices. One of the examples is, for example, Safari uh, uses this service to sync your opened uh, tabs uh, on different devices. So it's, it's not something exclusive uh, to iCloud Keychain. But iCloud Keychain uses this to uh, stores. And uh, what is interesting about those stores is that you can see that it, is, it says Cloud Keychain Proxy 3. 
And uh, in, during iOS 7 beta, it was just a cloud keychain proxy. So uh, apparently there's been some development and some last minute changes to the system. Same with secure backup, secure backup uh, T, secure backup daemon. So apparently Apple been changing something. Um, and during B beta, they have uh, purged those stores several times for all accounts. Um, these, uh, those are the uh, keys <coughs> and description of the values that are uploaded uh, to the uh, iCloud as part of iCloud keychain. So probably the most important one is this one, which contains uh, metadata such as uh, cloud security code uh, complexity. So it's basically a flag which, which tells you whether the security code is simple for digits or something more complex. Um, timestamp and country. Um, this shows whether the uh, escrow service is used or not. We will get uh, to this um, later. This is the keybag. Keybag is encrypted with a master password and you see there is no uh, indication of master, master password. As we figure out earlier, master password is sent to escrow proxy. And uh, what exactly is escrow proxy? Well, this is a new uh, service. And my guess is this, that it was designed exclusively for iCloud keychain, but it's actually more generic. It can store uh, any number of secret uh, data, any number of secret items. Access to the service requires uh, authentication token, and this is how all iCloud services work. So you need to know Apple ID and uh, Apple ID password. Uh, using that, uh, you authenticate to iCloud, and in return, you get your number, account number, and authentication token. And using that token and number, you talk to all the services. This is this, the case with this proxy, with this service. You need the same token to access the service, but uh, to actually get data, to um, read data that was sent to the service, you uh, need additional level of authentication. Um, you need to receive an SMS challenge and you need to complete a uh, secure remote password authentication, SRP authentication. The fun fact about this uh, service is that user agent that runs on iOS and OS X is called uh, Lucky2. And uh, if you Google that, you will find out that Lucky2 is a character from uh, Mario Brothers Nintendo game, which is the <coughs> cloud. So apparently there are some huge Nintendo fans in, in, in Apple, in California. And I have no idea what, like iCloud, maybe there is some sort of like cloud, like YouTube, whatever. So uh, the heart of the escrow proxy, as you can see here, is this uh, secure remote password. What is it exactly? Secure Remote Password is a protocol designed uh, by Stanford University in Stanford University, which is a zero-knowledge password-proof scheme. And uh, I'm not sure if probably some of you are familiar with this. If I'm not mistaken, one of the leaks from uh, Blizzard, perhaps, they, they have been using this uh, for, for, yeah, I think. Uh, so it's not new, but uh, actually, I would say that this is probably the most large-scale deployment of uh, secure remote password in, in, in mass like industries because yeah, Blizzard was big, but Apple probably be bigger. Uh, what's the point of this protocol? Well, uh, it was designed with two goals in mind. First, uh, be free of any patents. So there are no patents cover covering uh, SRP. And second, security specifically, uh, Attacker that can sniff traffic or can meet traffic cannot um, deduce enough information to perform offline attack on the password. So even if you have a man-in-the-middle condition on the running SRP, you cannot get like challenge response or something. You cannot uh, get enough data to then mount an uh, offline uh, brute force attack. When implemented correctly, uh, SRP will only allow attacker one password guess per connection. So attacker connects to the server, uh, guesses one password, tries to guess one password. If the password is not correct, the server will drop the connection. So reconnect. This enables like relatively easy throttle, throttling of the uh, password attempts. Another 
thing is that uh, password verifier is not sufficient for impersonation. This means that if server storage gets compromised, for example, if somebody gets hold of all the like hashes, which are called password verifiers, uh, of all password verifiers from Apple, they will not be able to use those password verifiers direct directly to impersonate you, to impersonate as a user. They will have to first run through a like brute force to recover the original passwords. And Escrow Proxy uses a latest um, version, latest flavor of this protocol, which is SRP6A. So this is how the protocol works. Uh, it consists of two main phases. And before the protocol can start, the parties have to agree uh, upon some of the parameters. So they need to select hash function. They need to select group. And they need to select multiplier k, which is, well, in, in this case, in case of SRP6A, it is a hash of group parameters. The password verifier is the thing which is stored on the server. It consists uh, of the salt, which is random, and value v, which is generator to the raised to the power x, x computed from salt and user password. So the protocol itself runs as follows. So the device. Uh, initiates the protocol. It generates a random number A, uh, raises generator to the power of A, and sends that A capital along with the user ID to the server. Server generates random number B, computes this value, and sends it back to the device. Now, both the server and the device perform some mathematical operations that result in the value key. Key uh, here is the shared encryption key. It is the same for both uh, the device and the server. But to be absolutely certain about this, uh, both parties need to ensure that they actually agreed on the same key. They need to make sure that the key is the same on both ends. Um, this is done during key verification phase, and it, it's done like this way. Both parties compute M, and then uh, device uh, sends M to the server. Server verifies that M is correct, and if it's not, and it is very important, that server must drop the connection if M is not correct. And also, it is also very important that device must present its proof M first, not the server. So in this sense, everything is implemented correctly. Um, Scroll proxy implements very uh, standard SRP. It's very by the book. So you can open the specification and you can see that everything is just exactly as it's written in specification. Uh, there are only few minor changes. Well, first of all, the hash function is uh, SHA-256. The group is 2048-bit uh, group from specified in RFC 5054, which is an RFC for uh, SRP authentication in TLS. And the protocol itself is modified to uh, accept SMS challenge codes. So not only random number and user ID is sent, but also a challenge, SMS challenge, which is sent by the server to the user's phone. So this is uh, how the protocol works, but how the exactly, exact, exact process uh, works. So when device when the device wants to recover some data from the scroll proxy, it first uh, lists the, list the um, available scroll records. So it issues get records comment to the server, and server uh, responds with the list of available records. Then device asks for the list of associated phone numbers. So it, it uh, runs get SMS targets comment, and the server responds with the list of phone numbers that are associated with, the, with an account. Um, I'd like to say that those phone numbers are used only for display purposes, so uh, the device will show you notification something like, we have sent you uh, an SMS to number blah blah blah, please enter this, the, uh, SMS the SMS code. So device will not uh, like send this number back, it, it will not let user to select the the phone number to send a challenge to. So next, the device requests that SMS challenge to be sent. Um, and the once user enters that SMS challenge into the 
uh, device, it initiates the SRP protocol. So SRP init <coughs> command, it accepts the DSID. DSID is a numeric uh, identifier of your Apple ID, which is probably directory services ID or something. A is the random number, SMS code is the SMS challenge, and the server responds with the unique ID of the transaction with the same DS ID with random salt, well, salt associated with, the, with an account, and random value B. And uh, after that, device requests the actual recover of the data. So it computes value M, which is the most important piece of information here, and if M is correct, server, server will send back IV and encrypted escrowed record. Uh, and that escrow record is encrypted with the key uh, K, which is a shared key um, computed during the SRP authentication. So probably this is too much, but yeah, just bear with me for a second. So I will try to explain this in, in, in more detail. So what other comments are available? Uh, for this uh, service? Well, the very first thing uh, the device does when you enroll, when you enable iCloud Keychain is to run get club cert comment. I'm not sure what it's doing. Probably it gets some certificate or whatever. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen it used too much. Enroll uh, sends uh, <coughs> secret data to the service for, for storage. Get records, get SMS targets, generate SMS challenge, SRP net recover, we have just covered. <laughs> the last one is funny, uh, alter SMS target. It uh, enables you to change the phone number to which the SMS will be sent. This is not exposed anywhere in the UI, but I have a Python script that can do this. Uh, so this actually leaves me to believe that uh, this SMS has nothing to do with uh, two-factor authentication at all. So this might be well, some sort of rate limiting or whatever. I don't know, but um, yeah, w one difference. Uh, this, this thing, the only difference from other comments is that uh, it requires you to supply Apple ID and password. It will not work if you supply uh, authentication token. So, but yeah, if you know Apple ID and password, you can choose any number you want. So you, you, you don't have to, to worry about this. It's, it's, not, it's not falling apart, yeah, it's, um, I just don't think it's, it's a two-factor authentication in, in, the, in the sense that we, 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 we used to. So it may be a two-factor <coughs> authentication to combat you know, a situation where somebody intercepted your authentication token, but yeah, ob honestly I think this is very, very strange. And also, and Apple states this on their website, this uh, SMS thing, it doesn't work in some countries. Probably they don't have the global SMS coverage or something. Mm -hmm. So most countries do work. Uh, Norway works, Russia works, uh, uh, but some don't. And uh, yeah, again, presence of this thing makes me think that this is not exactly a two-factor authentication we're used to. So, well, okay, let's get back to our escrow record. Uh, look at this and uh, try to figure out what exactly we can get from this server. Well, I can help you. We will get a scroll record, which is random password encrypted with the key computed from the iCloud security code. And our goal is to somehow uh, decrypt <laughs> the passwords uh, that are uh, sent to the iCloud from the keychain. And to decrypt that, to decrypt the keychain, we need to get random password. And to get random password, we need apparently to get, get the key, uh, and to get the key we need to get uh, a cloud security code. So how do we do this? Well, apparently uh, this stuff is stored by Apple uh, on, the, on their servers. Mm. A cloud security code is four digits by default. Anybody see any problem? And Apple states that information <laughs> cannot be read by Apple. Really? Really? Well, uh, my response is that yes, they can. <laughs> um, and here's how. Um, if you're Apple or anybody with similar level of access, you can get 
uh, data and you can run offline uh, guessing on the iCloud security code. Uh, since there are only 10,000 possible simple uh, co uh, security codes, the attack will be almost instant and always successful. With iCloud security code, you can decrypt keyback, keyback password, sorry. Yeah, keyback password will uh, decrypt the keyback, keyback keys. And with unlocked keyback, you can decrypt uh, all the keychain items that are synced to the iCloud. So um, Apple or any other adversary with similar level of access to their storage can near instantly decrypt master password and uh, all iCloud keychain records for default settings. So apparently, mm, this is, uh, I think this is important to know. Okay, but what about other um, setup options? So, so far we have only looked at the simple, the default, but yeah, I think uh, everybody here understands that default cannot be secure. So what about others? Well, use a complex security mm -hmm. code. Well, diagram is exactly the same except that uh, instead of the simple four digits, we can use arbitrarily long uh, passphrase or password. Um, so everything is exactly the same. Offline password recovery is still possible, but it, it won't be uh, as successful because there are much more possible passwords and it will not be like uh, guaranteed to succeed. The passwords are apparently uh, more complex. But uh, again, attack is still possible because we have uh, data stored uh, in the ISCOR service. Get random security code. This is the third option. So um, how, how this works exactly? Well, this part is not used. If you choose to, uh, to use random, password uh, as a master password for your uh, iCloud keychain, then this part sh sh shown in red will not be used and the whole diagram will look only like this. So a scroll proxy is not used at all and uh, probably random security code is saved somewhere in the device. Well, for device to be able to sync, it must be able to compute the key and it must be able to somehow um, store the either the random key, uh, either the random password or the, the encryption key. So, but um, actually I haven't verified this, but my guess is that they're storing something and that might be extracted. <coughs> um, so the last one is to not use security code at all. And this is a very interesting one. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know how it works yet. What I, can know, what I can tell you about this is that uh, it's not using a scroll proxy. It is using a key value service. Um, it's sort of, it looks like it maintains some sort of uh, key directory for all, all your devices and they somehow communicate with each other uh, through this service. But uh, I'm not really sure how it works. So, um, Apple claims that in this uh, that in this case nothing, uh, no passwords are uploaded to the iCloud keychain, and so far this seems to be the case. So it looks like devices are exchanging keys through the uh, key value service, but actual password exchange happens through push mes messages or something. And uh, yeah, this is work in progress. Maybe when I have more time, I will figure out how it works. So this is pretty much it. Uh, Conclusions for today are pretty much as usual. Trust your vendor, but verify the claims. Uh, even if the vendor is Apple, um, never ever use simple iCloud security code. Uh, do not think that SMS that you receive as a part of iCloud keychain uh, dance has something to do, has anything to do with two-factor authentication. It's not. It's for some other reason. Uh, I'm not sure for exactly for which one. And yet I can say that iCloud Keychain is reasonably well engineered, um, although it definitely has shortcomings. Why I, am I saying this? Well, we've been looking at the system from the point of view, can Apple compromise this? Well, definitely can. And there are many different ways Apple can access your data. But uh, think about 
this from different perspective, can an outside uh, attacker uh, compromise this? And uh, I would say that with respect to outside at uh, attacker, the system is reasonably well engineered because there are proper safeguards in place. Securing what password is a fair choice of protocol uh, for this stuff. And uh, yeah, they're definitely doing uh, rate limiting and account, lock, account, account locking if you try to brute force SMS challenge or uh, uh, iCloud security code. So I have my account locked for some time because of that. Um, during uh, during uh, iOS beta, the SMS challenges that you received, they were four digits. Uh, now they're six digits. So Apple is constantly uh, adjusting. So yeah, it's not perfect, but it's uh, reasonably well, uh, I would say. That's it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, I will be happy to answer them. Questions from the back. The question is uh, whether it's possible to uh, to mount an online attack. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Just a second. I will. Say again. So uh, back to this slide. To, to mount an online attack, uh, you would probably focus on this guy. And to, to do this, you will basically need two things to be successful with this attack. You will need to know Apple ID and uh, password of the user and uh, a cloud security code. So let's assume that you know uh, Apple ID uh, and the password because, well, you just know it. Um, you need to brute force or somehow recover the four-digit pin. Well, I would say that if you're not Apple, this is relatively difficult because uh, trying each pin requires you to run an SRP against the server. And the server will basically throttle you down after several attempts. And then after like 10 attempts, it will just uh, lock the account. So this is the safeguard. And also, you will have to receive uh, SMS challenge for each one, for each attempt. And if you just try to uh, send fake uh, SMS challenges, uh, fake data in instead of uh, proper SMS challenges, you also get your account locked. So um, the, mechanisms, the mechanism of uh, account locking is not clear, um, but there are two sorts of uh, account lockout. There is soft lock and hard lock. Soft lock happens pretty quickly. Hard lock happens uh, if you ignore the soft lock and continue what do, to do what you're doing. Like uh, the normal tools, the, the phone will uh, will not be well. It will uh, honor the soft lock thing and will not allow you to to do anything. But if you're, for example, using some automated scripts. Uh, and ignore soft lock, then the account will go in hard lock, and then you have only to reset the stuff, <coughs> reset the thing. Uh, also, kind of uh, search for remote users. If you know what you're going to put a password, then you could use uh, your somewhere like so remote. Yeah, the, the comment, the comment uh, is that uh, this can um, constitute a denial of service attack. I, yes, this, this can probably the, be the case. So it's, it's fairly easy to um, to lock user's account. But again, this lock is only, it's not the iCloud, the Apple account lock. It's only for this particular service. So user will not be able to um, to recover his iCloud keychain. Yes, this, this is true. Uh, 
the question, is, the, the, the second question is uh, about uh, certificates, certificate pinning. Uh, you mean um, this? Yes. Uh, uh, you don't, um, well, the communication between device and server uh, happens uh, over HTTPS. To intercept HTTPS, you have to be like, you have to mount and man in the middle attack. So you basically place uh, proxy server here. For this to be successful, you need to, uh, you need the device to trust your proxy server. The device connects to the server, but actually it connects to your proxy, and device must verify that it's talking to proxy to server, not to your proxy. Um, so to achieve this, you generate any absolutely any certificate you save it to the uh, to the device you import it to the to your iPhone uh, you mark it as trusted and after that you just uh, conduct man in the middle what I'm trying to say here is that uh, this thing is not using certificate pinning certificate pinning is the thing when you, when the program which talks to the server um, uses hard-coded certificate and this thing is not using it so it is Easy to do a man in the middle on this on this account. Uh, Apple. It, it is easy to con configure, but you would have to do a little bit of work to either social engineer somebody to install a certificate. Mm. No, no, it's, it's not about it's not about uh, th this. This is just a, a setup for for research purposes. This is how I sniff the traffic. So it's not about tricking somebody to like uh, running man in the middle against somebody. It, it's. Uh, it's a matter of fact of running man in the middle against my own device just to figure out what happens. Because if the program, if the uh, phone, for example, uses certificate pinning for talking to this, this thing would be much, much harder because you have to, and uh, unless your device is jailbroken, it's almost impossible to do this. So you are talking from a research perspective. This is this. Uh, this where is you this own the device, not attacking somebody else. No, no. That's this communication. No, th this is basically how to sniff, how to figure out what happens with the device, not how to attack somebody uh, by using this technique. So, and uh, Apple is using, making this pretty easy to figure out what happens. Mm. Because no pinning. I mean, they, they use pinning for things like App Store and iTunes Store for uh, like money related services. They do. But uh, for other services, most of their cloud stuff, no pinning. More uh, questions? Uh, Yeah, exactly. absolutely. This is this is a this is a problem, uh, and this is why it is in red. Yeah, because you couldn't uh, get this information, you couldn't analyze uh, any, everything else. Uh, that. You 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 can, if there is pinning, there are ways around it, but it's just harder uh, because you need to get the binary, patch the checks, uh, do a lot of boring stuff. So, actually, lack of pinning. Well, well if if you ask me from like security researcher point, uh, uh, point of view. Uh, lack of pinning, uh, lack of certificate pinning is always uh, on the reports if you do like application assessment. If application is not doing certificate pinning, you always uh, put it into report and say that this is like uh, high priority or medium priority, high risk or something, depending on the application. But it is, it is always an issue and uh, there, are, there are reasons not to do it. But I think for stuff like uh, like this, uh, they definitely should do it because this is important. Okay. More questions? Thank you very much. Yeah. Break.